This is Invisible Inc., the podcast for under-resourced women entrepreneurs. And I'm your host, Shubha Chakravarti, founder of Achieve. Join me as I talk to women entrepreneurs about the nuts and bolts of their journeys and to experts who will give you insights that are hard to find anywhere else. Let's jump in. What does the VC investment process really look like? Why should women founders be wary of VC funds that are earmarked only for women? When fundraising, what hidden risk might scare an investor away that you as a founder may see as a big win? In this episode, Kim Barnum, general partner at Kinetic Ventures, talks about how the VC process can be molded to remove bias against women founders, the big disservice that women-focused VC funds do to women, the founder blind spot that is a red flag for potential investors, and much more. Now, here's Kim. Hello, Kim. Welcome to Invisible Inc. We're so excited to have you here today. Hi, Shuba. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to uh, share a little bit about Kinetic Ventures and our process and dive in a little bit deeper. Excellent. So as you mentioned, you're part of a pretty unique VC firm. You have a very different model. What got you involved with Kinetic in the first place and what's your role in the firm? So I've been at Kinetic Ventures for over seven years now, and the founder of Kinetic Ventures, Brad Zapp, he was my financial advisor prior to starting a VC firm. So when he started this firm, I joined on the team, not in an investment role, and quickly learned a lot about venture capital, early stage investments and was a principal and then became partner this past year, leading investments in 16 different states and in the European market as well. So how would you describe Kinetic and what's your firm's investment thesis and focus? As you said, we do things very differently here at Kinetic. So we are based in Covington, Kentucky, which is in the middle of America. And As you can probably imagine, Kentucky has some great startups, but not exactly the tech hub of the U.S. So we realized quickly into investing that we needed to build a technology platform to enable and allow founders to have access to capital regardless of where they're based. Kinetic focuses on all early stage investment. We do pre-seed and seed investments. We like to be one of the first investors in a funding round, along with angel groups or other institutional investors. And we invest in all different industries and sectors with the exception of life science. So we do not do pharma, med device, or we're open to any other industries with the exception of life science. You mentioned that your co-founder or your uh, president is a former financial advisor. So what led to the starting of this firm? What's the origin story? It's actually a pretty unique story as he was running a family office that he started. He was going through a divorce at the time and used this app called Chore Monster. And basically kids would do chores and get points to buy something. And he sent an email to the company saying, this has changed my life. Had no idea it was an early startup company that happened to be in Cincinnati, close to where our firm is. So They responded to him and he learned about this. And it's very interesting because obviously all financial advisors, they have different levels, but this is the private market. And this is not something that they're offering to their clients being in the private sector. So he was like, this is amazing and decided that he wanted to figure out how this worked. And um, that's how he first discovered this. And, you know, as You talked about our process is pretty unique. Along the way, we've constantly evolved. And when we built Wendell, which is the technology platform that we use, at the time we didn't realize, but it completely eliminates the bias that exists in venture capital because we're asking every founder the same questions and we're using the AI and machine learning to then determine which companies are more likely to be a fit for us. There's multiple steps to this. It takes a founder about 15 to 20 minutes to complete the whole process. One widget, as you asked, like the financial background, knowing that you need certain returns. And obviously for any investor, we want to make 
money and how do we calculate and figure that out, which you can do that manually, but we can also input an algorithm into our machine learning and AI based on your current revenue, how much funding you've raised in the past, how quickly you're growing. And by a click of a button, it can spit out expected return multiples. We'll see all kinds of different financial information. That's one step and one part of the process. Another part of the process is a personality assessment that we call team print. Every investor that you talk to, they always talk about the team, the team, the team, the team. What we realized is it's very difficult to have a startup company and you have to wear every possible hat you can imagine as a CEO, founder of a startup and different people are wired in different ways to be able to adapt to those changes or those roles at a very fast speed, because if you're hiring a CTO and you hire the wrong CTO, that can literally bankrupt a startup. So it is crucial to have the right team in place. And so what we actually did is we hired a full-time industrial psychologist and built out the team print personality assessment where we have the CEO go through as well as other leadership members on the team to see how this team works together and what their profiles are. And we have data that can now help us predict which companies are more likely to succeed based on how a founder is wired. So it sounds like the underpinning of your differentiator is the application of the AI. And the way you differentiate yourself is not only do you apply the AI, but you actually have actively taken steps to de-bias it. Then there's a financial component that the AI looks at, and then there's a team and personality component that it looks at. And together, that's kind of like the secret sauce that helps Kinetic do this process differently than I'll call it the typical VC firm. Is that a fair characterization of what you just walked us through? Yes. And then, you know, as you said, what differentiates us, a typical VC firm If you're an early stage deal and you have $50,000 in revenue and you are talking to a VC that only does invest in companies with a million and up in revenue, you've now just wasted the founder's time as well as your own time. But for us, we want to spend our time on calls with the companies that are more likely to get a check from us right now and save the founder's time as well as ourselves. So we're using our time the most appropriately through using technology and data. So we call Wendell a junior analyst. So, you know, anyone could input certain things like you can put input that you're doing 5 million in revenue, but we're still doing standard due diligence. So if it's a fit based on what you put into Wendell, we then depending upon where your company's located between the partners at Kinetic Ventures, whichever state, if it's my state, you would be doing the diligence process with me. So we would have a call and then like every other VC, a list of what items we need for due diligence. We like to come in at the pre-seed and seed stage. We do not do anything with over a $15 million valuation. So that's the big thing for us too. So if you're raising $5 million on a $20 million valuation, I don't want a founder to waste their time. But these are things that I will see in my initial call when a company is a fit. I can get so much deeper on the initial call and in-depth because I have all of this data that they've already input. So I know what questions I want to ask the team. I've already seen your pitch deck because you'll upload a pitch deck. So it just makes the whole process quicker and more efficient. And for us, we can make an investment pending a data room and you have all the diligence items. We can close on an investment within three business days. So we're able to move really quickly pending that you have all these documents. And every company is at different stages. Some may not have some of these. Not everything applies to every company. So it very rarely happens that quickly, but we have made investments within actually probably two business days. So our portfolio, we have over 100 companies currently in it. 
which 64% of our portfolio companies are female and minority founders. And this is by taking a data-driven approach and eliminating the bias that is there with VCs and everybody has underlying biases that we may not even realize that we have. I just love that. So basically two out of every three founders that you're funding are some kind of underrepresented founder, like right? either female and or a person of color. That's that's fantastic. The biggest takeaway I had from the process was actually two big takeaways. One was the removal of bias because you have automated or put on a technology a lot of the issues that might cause rise to bias. And the second was the removal of the lot of the friction, especially for women. We hear that they take a multiple number of meetings more than a comparable male founder to even get to the point where a check is being written. And I won't even talk about the size of the check or the valuation or the share of equity. So those are the two big things that you talked about. So first off, how did you develop the search process? And what about developing the AI? At what point did you say, geez, we shouldn't be putting in gender and race as evaluative criteria? Can you walk us through kind of how you develop that search and funding process over time? And what are some of the pivotal learnings through that journey? Were there like big aha moments? And how did they select how you ended up with this process? I feel like there's aha moments weekly here at Kinetic because we are very unique. We're a technology-based venture capital firm. And anyone that's ever had a startup when you're building something from the ground up, you're going to have technical glitches. So when we first launched, it was one thing after another, and it's still not perfect. We originally created this software because we don't have the funding to have employees scattered all throughout the United States. So we needed a way, and everybody knows how powerful data is. We needed a way to actually capture this and use data instead of our gut to make decisions and to actually be able to look back at data like any type of AI and machine learning, it gets smarter over time. So we can now go back and look at companies that we did not invest in that have succeeded and companies that we passed on investment and maybe failed. What are the data points? What is this data showing us? When a company is a fit, it doesn't matter to me if you're a female founder or a male founder or a person of color. We want great founders and great companies. And these aha moments when you're looking at data, it's like, whoa, look at how many different types of people we've invested in. And this is by taking a data-driven approach. So that was actually a huge aha, very proud moment because there are a lot of funds out there. They may be just investing in females or people of color, which is great. But I also see this as a bit of a problem because as a female, both of us females, if we are both founders, a lot of times people will say, hey, have you gone to this fund that just invests in female founders? Well, that fund may be a $50 million fund, whereas the bigger part of their fund is a billion dollar fund. So now you and I are being sent to a fund that's giving us access to 50 million versus a billion dollars. So that was a huge aha moment. Every day we have a data meeting when we're looking at data. So as I say, there's constantly things that are coming up, like in the personality assessment that we're doing of these founders. Yes, we see like where they fall in the quadrant. We have a full-time industrial psychologist and our assessment has been double validated for fairness and gender, age, and race. Everybody listening has probably taken some sort of personality assessment and we can get into this because Sh Shuba took it and I would like to hear your results <laughs> on what it said about yourself. But what's interesting is a lot of these assessments were created in the 60s and 70s when it was mostly for executive level positions at companies and it was white elderly men in those roles. So there's a lot of age, race and gender discrimination and some other assessments out there. So we had this double validated for fairness. So there's multiple people using just our personality assessment within their organizations at some larger corporations, some smaller, just because it has been validated for fairness. 
I can't wait to get into it. But before that, let's talk about Wendell. I'm I'm hoping it's a girl. Tell me it's a girl. Is it a girl? Wendell's a boy, actually. Oh. Or I guess we could say uh, <laughs> we refer to Wendell as a he, but I guess Wendell can be whatever we want it to be. <laughs> okay. One day consider just ask them whether they want to be a boy or a girl or anything in between, but I just couldn't help asking. So Wendell is a big part of kinetics process and value proposition. At length, you talked about the role that Wendell plays both in the financial assessment as well as in the team assessment. How did you make sure as you were developing this AI that you are minimizing the impact of bias? Because even if you don't ask explicitly for, say, what is the founder's gender, what is the founder's race or what have you, there's always going to be implicit bias because of the data that is trained on. And we know that there's a lot of bias baked in the old data. So what did you do to de-bias explicitly the decisions that Wendell or the evaluations that Wendell would come up with? As I said, looking at the data, as far as we don't know, we're not asking, are you male or female when you go through our process? We don't ask about gender, what we're doing. We know our portfolio companies, the investments that we've made, that obviously if I invest in your company, I have a female founder. And I know that you're a female founder. We actually have a transgender that we invested in founder, which This is another aha, interesting moment. This founder previously, when she was a male, she had a startup and raised venture capital funding and had no problem. When she transitioned to a female, she was having all these issues raising funding. She went through our process. Like we, we don't meet these founders first. She went through and was a fit and she literally cried when we invested because if all of this discrimination that she firsthand experienced and her company is actually a DEI training platform for companies. But she said when she was a male, it was so much easier. And this was a firsthand encounter. So obviously this founder, we wouldn't know they're transgender when they're going through. We know once we've invested, because we have relationships with these founders And that's how we know, but our process doesn't have a way to take out that bias. It's just asking every founder the same questions and based on what the data, the AI is telling us is how we move forward with which companies we're going to initiate the conversations and start the due diligence process with. The founder feeds in all of the data and essentially what the AI does is it calculates an expected IRR, right? And then you have some threshold that says either it meets the IRR or it doesn't meet the IRR, right? Is that a fair characterization of how? Yes, I would say that's a fair characterization. You know, as I said, there's multiple steps in some of this as we talk about the team. And I want to touch on team print a a lot more on this podcast because it's really important. So when you take this assessment as a founder, We've had 4,500 companies apply for funding. And as a VC, you constantly have so many pitch decks sent over to you or calls that you're taking with these founders. But we now have data that you could say, have you heard of this company that maybe applied for funding three years ago? By a click of a button, I can see hundreds of data points about this company. They were doing this much in revenue in 2020. This was how much capital they were raising. So whereas other VCs, I don't think they may have an Excel sheet or some VCs claim to be using some type of AI or machine learning, but I can look at all that and see where this company is. And as I talk about the team print, the personality assessment, when investors talk about the team, we've realized with the 4,500 companies, what we're looking at is we like to talk about diversification at Kinetic Ventures. And by diversification, we mean different personality types. So on our assessment, there's four quadrants. There's different colors. There's a red, blue, green, and yellow quadrant. And if you have three co-founders that fall into the blue quadrant, which is what we consider specialist, technical, these people, they know their stuff. So you'll see companies with two or three co-founders that might all be different personality types in that specialist quadrant. And they have built out a beautiful technology platform that you are like, this is going to 
be a game changer in whatever they're trying to accomplish through their technology platform they've created. And they want to keep building more features and aspects and making it better, which is great, but you also need a co-founder or a team member that wants to take that technology in front of the clients that are going to buy it and pay you for it. So you need a client facing. You also need that take charge leader that's saying, this is where we need to go. We thought we were going to focus on calling on financial advisors, but we now realize that the HR market is bigger for what we've created. And it's like to make that pivot, which some people are like, no, it's finance. But to be able to see this is a bigger window of opportunity by our personalities, this is just naturally how people are wired. And then the other quadrant is your collaborators, they get things done as your company scales and large companies, you're going to see a lot of green personality types because they're your doers. They're going to do the work handed to them. So if you take a team that has three enterprise leaders, it may seem great at first, but they're all going to be arguing and fighting with each other over who's taking charge. And as I said, the technical, so it's diversification. If you can get one of each quadrant early on, you're going to scale quicker because, for example, Shuba, when you took this, you came back as an architect, which is in the specialist quadrant, but really close to the enterprise. So you're one over. So, you know, you're able, which you know yourself, and I'd like to hear your feedback on your results as an architect. What did you think when you took the assessment? Team back, I'm an INTJ. That's like my signature that literally is called the architect, right? So it came back pretty close to what I would have expected. But the one thing that threw me off was it said there's some extra amplify something, then it said gutsy. I don't know what that means. I'm hoping it's a good thing. <laughs> oh, it, it that's a great thing. So as I said, there's so many levels to this. But as a founder, one of the great things about our process is when you go through the whole process, which you only took our personality assessment portion, when you add team members, so as an early stage CEO, you know yourself a little bit, like you said, this was pretty accurate. But imagine knowing exactly how these your co-founder or other people, yes, you think you know them. But what's actually really interesting when we talked about Kinetic's journey and my journey here, when we started, when... Brad realized we need to do some sort of assessment. How is this founder wired? So when we took these assessments, we were taking multiple, I don't even know how many personality assessments I had to take. And I had been working at Kinetic for over two years. So you know a person, but you really don't know how you're wired. And one of the interesting traits that came back is I was on the extreme leadership side But you don't see that, you know, when I was in a role just before I was making investments, you're not seeing how competitive or how much I want to win versus, yes, I'm always willing to pitch in and help. And if it's someone else on the team doing diligence, give my input. You know, we're all team players and leaders at times, but this is just how we're wired to our core. And when you talked about the gutsy, so it it shows multiple things. We call those medals. So that is a very good thing. It means that you're willing to take a risk, which kind of demonstrates why you left consulting and are going down the startup route. Like you want more and that's just how you're wired. The medals are great. And like I said, if you're on here and you've taken this and you don't have a medal, it's the, it doesn't pass or fail a founder. These are just, we have layers and layers of things that are built into this. We are looking at, all the companies that go through, because like every investor, you can't invest in every deal. You're going to miss out on deals. So we just want to make sure that we are investing in the best founder and the best companies that we have access to. Got it. And that's super helpful. So to kind of bring it together, right? Can you walk me through a hypothetical situation where you have the financial analysis? I mean, they all come back together. So you know what the financial profile or at least what Wendell thinks is going to happen. And then you also know the team composition. So maybe it's fully balanced. Maybe it's not fully balanced. Now it's on your table. you got to make a call, especially because, as you mentioned, you've got a pretty short turnaround time. How do those two balance out? And what's the thought process and your decision process that's going to help you say yay or nay to any proposal that comes to your table? So, yes, I mean, obviously, every 
investment opportunity is unique and different. But as you took team print, for example, I'll use you as an example, and you came back as the specialist as an architect. And if you had one other co-founder and your co-founder was in the yellow quadrant and we've had a call, I've done due diligence, and I'm going to say with this funding, why are you raising this funding round, which is what every investor is going to ask. If you're saying you're raising this funding for sales, for example, for sales, you want the yellow quadrant, the client facing individuals. They are going to outperform. Yes, you can sell, but you're more technical to your core. So if you hire somebody that to their core is more client facing, they're going to perform better for you as a startup founder. So part of my diligence would be you know, you're raising this round to hire salespeople. I suggest that you use our tool. This is another thing we allow every founder to use this personality assessment to find a client facing individual for that role. And moving forward, say you end up hiring other quadrants, they didn't work out. You said, I should have listened to you. You have a little bit of everything. And majority of our portfolio founders absolutely are amazed. Like you said, this was spot on you. And when you're hiring people, even as a founder, you have certain personality types that you enjoy working with better. We call it a dynamic duo. So my feedback to you would be, if we're investing and you're focused on sales, like you need to hire these types of individuals. And when we go to do a follow-on funding, if you come back a year from now and the sales are there, but you're like, we need to build out additional features or your company's growing. And like I said, you need those operational individuals that get things done. You don't need someone that wants to come up with a new and better idea for the way that you're building out a feature on your platform. We would give that feedback to a founder. So it's like, all right, we're ready to invest here. But these are some things that I think will help you as you're scaling your business and your next funding round, the only thing that's going to change is the financials. Like you're not going to change as the person that you are. So if you've hired some other people, we would ask you a year from now when you're doing your next funding round, have those individuals take the assessment. And it's just kind of to give you feedback that you can take action on. Like it's actual data in front of your eyes that you can see this is how Kim is wired. This is how Julie's wired. This is how John is wired. So once we're ready to invest, you know, everyone's seen this data, but we discuss this, like, how is the team? How does this team look? What do we see as the strengths of this team and potential weaknesses? So we're looking at the positives and the potential negatives to help these founders and companies to grow and scale as much as possible. I love how you described it because yes, there's always a financial component, but then you're operationalizing one of the biggest value adds of a venture capitalist, which is I'm going to help you grow and I'm going to help you grow faster by giving you the resources and the kinds of skills and support that you wouldn't otherwise get without the support of this. And what I'm hearing is you bring that data-driven aspect to it, which is just saying you need XYZ, go find XYZ. And yeah, we're investors and this is the, I don't want to say exactly scientific in the sense of atoms and electricity and all that stuff, but it's still very data-driven to the extent that we're very clear that you need this skill for this function and therefore you need to make a match. So it's a pretty easy conversation to have in that sense. You have funded somebody, now they've got the check in their bank account. How does Kinetic stay connect or involved in the management of this firm in the, call it the next six to 12 months? And then secondly, what are you seeing in terms of specifically women and women of color founders in terms of how they respond to this versus maybe other investors they've had or other methods of management that they've seen in their corporate careers or whatnot? I'll answer the second question first, as far as female founders and people of color. I think it's just a breath of fresh air because like you said, they're being treated the exact same. And to be able to say, we're not just investing in women and people of color, we're investing in everyone. And as a female or a person of color, why are you not being treated equally and the same? And why do you have to work so much harder to get investment from different VCs or investors? So I think for women and people of color, they really enjoy this process because 
They don't have to jump through a million hoops and get asked completely different questions than a male that's raising VC funding would get asked. That's, for the most part, always usually great feedback of 4,500 companies I've talked about that have applied for funding. We have just over 100 companies in our portfolio. So you're obviously saying no to a lot. But even these companies we say no to, they are like, that was so unique. That was so fun. They like the process. You get your team print personality results back. And you also get an answer. So a lot of founders may be reaching out, sending pitch decks to VCs, and they get no response. So you get a response. Every founder gets a response. If you go through our process and you're listening to this call, you know, it's Kinetic Ventures. Uh, dot com and you can apply for funding, but it's in your junk. We respond every single person that goes through. If you don't complete it, we're like, we see that you started this application process. We still want to learn more about your company. So every founder is going to get a response when they're going through the process. And then about the other part, which is like once they're funded, how do you support them subsequent to the funding? So we have a fairly decent amount of companies in our portfolio, and I don't have the time, unfortunately, in my day to be, we're we're not running your company. We're giving you the funding that you need to scale your business. We support our founders as much as we can. If there's something that they want some feedback on, or what do you recommend for this? Or I'm thinking about raising a funding round. We're always willing to chip in and help. But as I said, we've built technology the personality assessment is a way for these founders to not make that wrong hire. Because my resume says that I have been a technical developer at a company for 25 years. I am the advocate client facing profile, more of a sales individual would be my type of personality. And if I sent my resume to you, you would maybe think, oh, 25 years, she's been here. We an aha moment, one of our portfolio companies had two individuals that he had narrowed down to who he was going to hire for this role. And one individual came from Meta, I guess I can say which company, and the other individual didn't have quite the background. And they took the team print and he hired the person that wasn't at Meta. And he said, if he would have gone just off of resumes in the initial interview, he would have hired that employee. But the person he hired based on what Wendell said, he said, she is doing absolutely unbelievable in this role. He is just shocked. And he's like, I'll never hire another employee without using this. And this is something that they don't need as a founder in our portfolio. They don't need to reach out. They have access to this tool where they can add three different candidates that they're looking at for a developer role or a sales role or a marketing role or whichever role they're hiring. So, you know, that's a value add that no other VC is doing anything really like this, as we've talked about how unique our process is. But when we invest, we're trusting in the founder to scale a business. Obviously, we want to help all of our portfolio founders. But I think angel investors and VCs, that's a main difference. Angel investors seem to be more involved They may be part-time or retired and have the time. Like I'm looking at hundreds of deals a month. We have a portfolio we're managing. We're building a technology platform where things are constantly changing. So we're not holding a founder's hand, but we're always there to support in any way that we can. One other question on that, and we'll move on to some other interesting areas. So one is clearly the support to hire people, especially early stage is critical, right? Your team is going to make or break what you're doing. Another thing that VCs you expect or founders expect VCs to offer is connections. I can pick up the phone and call these great people and make all kinds of magical things happen. How do you counter that? And how do you address that specific need of founders over and above the technology? With every founder, when they're raising funding rounds and for venture capital firms, we're constantly sharing deals with each other because you're never taking very few funds or taking the whole round. We're all friendly. So I've invested in a company like today, I had a call with one of my portfolio companies 
He sent me over the pitch deck. He's getting ready to raise. I circulated his deck last week with another VC. They were having a call this afternoon. What I do is when you have your pitch deck, I will send that to VCs in our network. So this company's raising. Let me know if you want an introduction. So we usually just send the pitch deck. If it's someone that we're doing a call, like we have calls with other VCs, they'll say, what, what deals are you looking at or any anything coming your way? Because when we're a pre-seed and seed investor, we don't invest past the Series A. So we want to be your first money in. We'll follow on. But we need to be very well connected with those Series A and Series B investors because our portfolio companies, we need them to get funding. So pretty much the most common way is just circulating pitch decks with other partners at VC firms and understanding what industry they're looking at. So we're diversified. If it's a consumer product, there's VCs that focus just on consumer products or they only do software. So I'm not going to send them that pitch deck. So we know what different VCs are looking for and we circulate pitch decks for our founders. Because one thing that I think every founder needs to understand, we're on your team. We're investing in you and your company. We want to win and succeed just as much as you do as a founder. So nobody wins unless we both win and we're doing this together. And that brings me to a very important point for VCs, which is exits, right? I mean, you're here for exits and you mentioned that you're going only through series A and not past that. Have you had successful exits? And if so, what have you observed in terms of learnings about these exits, given that you may not be as involved once they take on series B, series C, and so on? Can you talk about that a little bit? Kinetic is only seven years old and with any type of early stage investment, the amount of time, the longer these companies are going, the more valuable they're going to become. So we have had some exits, but we would prefer for these companies to keep growing because it's going to be more valuable to us as well as the founder. One of the questions I ask in part of my diligence process, because every founder is different. So if you we're asking me for investment and say you're raising a million dollars on a $5 million valuation. And I would ask you if, if somebody comes to you and offers you 20 million for your company in three months, what would you say? And this is just what I think this may be a bias with angel investors. It's their own money. So they're like, Oh, I, 4x my money or 3x my money. This is great. They can turn around and invest. Well, VC firms are not in this for a 2 or 3x. We want outsized returns. We want to think when we're investing in a company, we're going to get at least at the very minimum 5x our money. So we want even bigger returns. So some founders, and that's what in your personality comes into play here sometimes, they get tired and it's like, oh, I can sell and have a couple million dollars, which is great. You can have a couple million dollars. But if you're a 30-year-old founder, this isn't enough money for you to go start your own fund or never have to work again. So that's one of the questions that I typically ask in diligence, just because I'll get to see what are you thinking as a founder? Like, is this a short term. And like I said, some angel investors, this is great. They would be like, sell your company. Whereas I would say, if you're already getting these offers after two years in market, keep scaling and keep growing. And this is where you say, what's the relationship? I'm like, yes, you can get 20 million, but what do you think you're going to be getting offered three years from now? And do you want to do this for three more years to walk away with 100 million versus 5 million as a founder. So I put that into perspective and want to know that because we are in this for the long haul. So when you ask about our companies, the ones that have had exits, it's been a two or three X, like nothing that is, oh, this is great. I mean, obviously, yes, the company didn't go under, but it's still so early to even predict. And I mean, venture capital and angel investing, it's 
you know, it's a roller coaster. One day you think a company's going under and the next day they have just raised a huge funding round or brought on a major customer that changes the landscape and where the path that the company is going down. So it's really hard to predict. And part of us, the window, as we talked about this a lot, like I said, we're not trying to predict which company is the next unicorn. We are trying to predict the ones that do not succeed, the bankruptcies, the companies that go under. So that's what's more important to us to make sure that we're these companies that are going under, are there certain data points you're seeing? Is there some pattern here that, you know, that we've identified? It gives us data to back up what's going on. And like I said, this isn't just our portfolio companies. This is other companies that we're looking at. I love it because two things. One is it reminds me of Warren Buffett's rule. One is don't lose money. And rule two is don't forget rule one. It kind of reflects that. And then Secondly, what I also like is that it focuses the light very brightly on de-risking your startup, right? As an investor, you're looking at how risky is this as opposed to, can I make out like a bandit if everything goes well? That's kind of a given because otherwise you wouldn't be investing in it. But once that that's a given, it becomes very clear to me based on what you said that you're always looking to clip the downside risk and say, how can you limit the downside while you continue to preserve the upside and amplify it? Is that a fair characterization? Yes. Another thing to point out here is when we talk about bias and and what you'll see when you've invested in companies, you have this relationship and you want them to succeed. And when the company's not doing well and the data helps us to not keep funding something, like you'll see a lot of investors that are like, well, if they raise another million, that this is going to get them past this hurdle. Whereas we would say, we're already invested in your company. We still believe in you, but we're not participating in this funding round. We hope that they succeed, but the data helps us. And like I said, when you come back, we're updating the financials in our... So that's the only thing that changes in future funding rounds and adding a few team members. But if it doesn't make sense, we pass on investment. So the data helps us like when you really like someone, it's so hard not to be like, ah, I still believe in them. Here you go. And you'll see that a lot with institutional and angel investors. And I think that's a bias because you like an individual personally or still think their business is a good idea. That doesn't mean that that company is going to succeed. So that helps us to the data-driven approach to keep us on track, to make sure we're not allowing that bias to come in to influence like funding a company that isn't where we expect them to be to get a check. In that case, do you give them any kind of feedback that says, hey, you know, you looked great last year, but your numbers aren't looking so hot right now. Obviously, you want to preserve the value. What do you do in that case? So one thing here, we are all about transparency and honesty, and we just tell the founder, like, this is where you were a year ago. This is where you told me you would be. You're not even close to these projections. We gave you feedback that you needed to hire salespeople, yet your team isn't working out. We'll pull up the pie chart from the personality assessment. We would say, who who have you hired since then? We're completely transparent with the founder. And as a founder, you get told no a lot, but honesty is really important. And honesty is what you need to hear because I'm not here to boost your ego. And it, that's not what the point is. This is, we need to win. And that's part of the assessment. Are you a team player? Or are you a leader? Like being a team player is, oh, it's okay. We're going to get there. But no, a leader's like, no, this isn't acceptable. And it's not that we're not going to support you, but you're not where we need you to be right now. Maybe your next funding round, like maybe we pass. And the next funding round, we participate again. So we're always completely transparent with our founders. Got it. And that's helpful to know. And it's so good, at least as a founder, because you know where you stand at at any given point, which brings me to the question of your experience with women founders and especially women founders of color. There's a little complex dynamic once you get money from someone because there's the money power dynamic and there's also the dynamics of gender and whatever else you want to throw into the mix. So it gets pretty complicated. What have you learned about your experience managing women founders and diverse women founders that can help them improve their performance of their own startups that they may not get 
elsewhere. I think female and female founders, people of color are outperforming. I think as women, we have to wear multiple hats every day in our life. So what we've seen a lot is the valuations are not at the same level for female founders. And the returns, like as I was giving that example of a company, if we're investing in the first funding round, it, a $2 million valuation, and they exit for $20 million, that's a win to us. You know, if you we're investing in your round at an $18 million valuation and you exit for 20, you know, that that's, you know, we're not getting excited for you. But for the female founders, I just think keep moving forward like all of us do and all female founders do and grow your business. But what women have to do on the amount of funding and people of color, you may have a million dollars versus a male counterpart is getting 10 million in funding. So we're able to do a lot more with a little amount of money. And I think just be realistic and we need to have a voice for ourselves because we are just as capable of the males. And what we've noticed in our portfolio is somebody told me, and I don't know where this came from, but that the funding went decreased in 2022 in female founders. And a lot of times these women may get initial funding rounds, but what our data has shown us that female founders aren't getting those second and third funding rounds that are the large sums, you know, when you're raising a 20 or $30 million round at, you know, $120 million valuation as a partner, it's in my relationships with VCs. I want to make sure that I keep pushing these companies with these females and people of color because they're doing amazing things and they need to be given the follow-on funding as well. So just breaking down these barriers and why these still exist because they shouldn't. And it's about a team and the person, not are you male or female and diversification amongst the team. And even for female and people of color, we are outperforming. So why is the money not coming to us? And that's an economic issue for you too, right? Because especially if you're not going to do all the funding all the way, the fact that somebody who's female or a person of color facing a differential market for subsequent funding could impact your returns pretty significantly, right? So it's not only the right thing to do, but it's completely in your economic interest to make sure that you're breaking down those walls, which is what I like about your model because you are almost forced to do that, you know, to realize the return. So that's just great. Do you have any concern that other large, well-heeled firms would come in and replicate or build other AIs that could essentially do what you're doing just bigger and drive you out of business? We hope there are more, more people need to be using data. So VCs that are listening, it really is powerful. And it's same with a startup. If you think no one else has this idea or is going to do that, this world's a big place. But we believe so much in what we're doing and think other VCs should be taking the same approach. You're never going to go out of business because companies are always looking for funding. Maybe we end up with a portfolio that's 95% female and people of color, if that's what the data is telling us. But to go out of business, there's always companies. And that's what we do not invest in San Francisco. So we invest everywhere with the exception because one majority of deals are there. We're looking for these companies and founders that are spread throughout the US. For example, you're in Chicago. There's a lot of VCs, there's accelerators, there's multiple things for founders in Chicago. Take someone that lives three hours outside of Chicago, still in the state of Illinois. They don't even know what VC funding is. They don't know what an accelerator is, but they're still coming up with a business idea and building that in a small town that's three hours outside of Chicago. So there's always going to be companies that need funding. So it's not a worry of going out of business if other people start building or using AI. We actually hope that more people realize how valuable this is to an investor, to a fund, to be able to show this is real-time data that we can show all of our LPs, how our 
fund is performing, what we've seen, what we missed out on. As I said, we're very transparent with our portfolio companies and our LPs. It's one of the pillars that we stand by through and through. And we have the data that shows not that this is surprising, but honest founders, we can measure this through the assessment. They obviously perform way better than people that are not honest. And you can't tell if someone's honest from a few phone calls or even diligence. So this is something that the data is showing us this, which of course, you're not going to ever be able to see someone's dishonest in doing due diligence on a company. This is why you need actual data that's showing you this is a flag that came up and, and this is through a validated assessment. Is that coming in the data from the financials or is it coming from the team assessment? The the team assessment. Give me an example. I'm not connecting the dots for some reason. How we're looking at the team print? Not how you're looking at the team print, but how this dimension of honesty versus dishonesty shows up in the team print. So like, for example, when you went through, it shows that you're honest. So, you know, you're in our system and you were an honest founder. But what about my profile told you? How, how do you know I'm honest? Because by what, how you're answering these words. So it, the, the personality assessment, there's a lot of layers and things that we are able to see when a founder's taking this and people that try to game the system, that's going to show up. This is an assessment. It can see. You can't click that you're outgoing, yes, and shy, yes. Like you're not outgoing and shy. So from things from, and we have a full-time industrial psychologist. So this has been studied. What are certain words or things that would show up as dishonest? Because you're not going to click, I'm dishonest. Nobody's going to do that. (laughs) But yeah, so there's a lot of things that we see from our end that it's like, oh, this is good, good, good. Like when you asked about the metal that you were concerned about, like metals are good. But it doesn't mean if somebody doesn't have a medal, we will still invest. So there's several different factors. The data just gets smarter over time, just like our portfolio companies. So maybe your grit medal, we come to find out 10 years down the road that people with the grit medal, they're outperforming. So imagine founders coming through. If you see that, that's going to be a green light. Like this is a good thing. Like we need to get on a call with this founder in this company right now. So yeah, that's just one of the ways we're using the data in in the decision process. Fascinating. I didn't realize that, but now I know. So I'll be very <laughs> careful next time. Just kidding. You've met a lot of founders, especially women of color. What top five pieces of advice would you give, whether they come to you or anybody else? I'm a founder. I know I need outside money and I want to make my startup successful. What five pieces of advice would you give? The first thing is you need to have a good relationship and trust the people you're taking the money from because you're going to be working with them. So yes, you need funding, but as much as you're being vetted in the diligence process, I think it's important for founders to also vet the angels or the institutions that are investing in them because you want to make sure, like I said, this is a long road and journey together. Have someone that you want to work with. I think that's important Number two, I think it's really important to make sure that you keep pushing through. You're going to get a lot of no's. This is everyone. And this is a long journey. Three, surround yourself with a board that can help you. And as we talk about the personality assessment, it's really important. The things that you do not feel that are your strengths, make sure you're finding a co-founder or other employees you hire that bring those your pitfalls out as strengths. And if it's from a board member, four, as I say, the board, it's very important, I think, to have a board and people that are not in your company that you can gain knowledge from and that can help you succeed from their experience. I think that's crucial at the early stage. And then five, you just have to truly be passionate about what you're doing because it's going to shine through and you're going to get funding, you're going to succeed, and you have to have that belief in yourself, your company, and the drive to get you through the roller coaster ride you're on, but it's all worth it. (laughs) 
Absolutely. And on the flip side, are there any don'ts that you have observed, particularly from either those you've funded or those you've not funded that would be extra applicable to women and women of color? Do your research before you reach out and be prepared. Like the more prepared you are when you are looking for funding, the better your chances are of getting funded. So having a data room put together, being prepared for what these investors are going to ask you and don't be intimidated. I think it's easy sometimes for a lot of founders when they're raising funding to feel intimidated by investors or VCs, but look at them as a a co-founder almost, like somebody you want to work with and just be honest, transparent in why you want to grow this. And don't be afraid to have these women, I feel like, Female founders and people of color, their projections are always so much lower, which to myself is a VC looking at a deal. We know these are 95% of the time, you're, these founders are not meeting these numbers. But when you look at a female founder pitching, she's actually probably going to meet these numbers because they're lower. It's not this astronomical ballpark. So don't be afraid. It doesn't have to be exact when you're doing, this is what I think I'm going to do. Like. Obviously, you need to have reasons why you think you're going to get to these numbers. But I feel like women and people of color don't seem to be as bold with where they're going or where they think they're going to go with their business, more realistic, which for me as an investor, I actually like to see that. But don't be afraid to reach for the stars. Awesome. I love it. And on that note, is there anything I should have asked you, but I didn't? Well, just obviously anybody that's listening that's looking for funding, you can go to our website. It's kinetic.ventures and you just click apply for funding. And I'm always willing to help out any founders or answer any questions. As I said, we're always looking for great founders and companies to invest in and super excited that you're doing a podcast to bring more awareness and want to level the playing field because all of us women on this call deserve to be here and to be heard and to be successful. Thank you very much, Kim. And you people like you are the ones who make it possible. So on that note, I want to thank you. It's been a very informative and quite enjoyable chat to learn about all the little nuances of Wendell. And thank you so much for being here and sharing all of your insights. It's been amazing. Thank you very much for having me. Have a great day. The VC world is opaque and, frankly, quite depressing for women founders to deal with. But pushing past that 2% funding statistic that gets thrown around all the time is hard, and it's hard to get real insights and actionable pointers if you're the founder in need of funding. That's why I really enjoyed my chat with Kim. She brought lots of fresh perspectives and insight into a process that few founders understand well. Here are my big takeaways. First, despite risks, There is a way to use AI to set right the imbalance in VC investing. Even though these models may have been trained on biased data, her firm's experience shows that AI-assisted investment decision-making produces significantly better outcomes for women, or could. Find investors who actively seek to de-bias their decisions. Second, her comments on why women founder-focused VC funds can actually harm women were quite eye-opening. Why be satisfied with crumbs when you can take a shot at the whole loaf especially if you have a great startup. Last but not least, bringing transparency and a disciplined rules-based philosophy to managing portfolio companies is very critical to easing stress and clarifying expectations to founders. This is supposed to be the norm, but Kim's comments highlighted the advantage of bringing both head and heart to these tough conversations that leave both the founder and the investor better off. So, what one thing will you integrate into your own fundraising efforts going forward? Thanks for listening to today's episode. We have show notes and more at achieve.co. That's A-C-H-I-I-V dot C-O forward slash podcast. Like what you heard? Hit subscribe and share with a friend. See you on the next episode. Now, go be an achiever.